Right then, I've done about 600 miles on this 1,000 pound, 7.9 kilogram AliExpress carbon special here uh, behind me. And during that time, a lot has gone wrong actually, but a hell of a lot has gone right as well. So yeah, lots to cover in this episode, so let's crack on. Okay, right, so I thought I'd try and film the uh, sponsor spot out on the bike this morning. So let's, uh, let's, see, how, let's see how this goes. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty cold and miserable December morning out here in Oxfordshire. I think it's like one degree C right now, but today's sponsor, Sirocco, well, they're, they're protecting my weak and feeble body from the, from, the, from the elements. So on the top here, I got one of my favorite bits of kit from them. This is one of their J1 jackets. This thing is super comfortable on the bike, really nice and cozy, and it's shower proof too. Plus, I really love this high collar on here. I think it looks really st stylish actually, and it keeps the wind out too. Now on the bottoms, I'm running their BX Envelaria bib tights. I've had these things for a little while actually. They're really comfy as well. They've got some great padding in the bum, which is good. <laughs> and they've also got these windproof panels on the, on the thighs and on the shins as well. So again, keeps the wind out, keeps you nice and warm. Um, so yeah, if you did want to check out Sirocco, they've got all sorts of gear, not just for, for the winter, but kind of all season. Um, so yeah, use my link in the description down below. Save yourself 10% off the entire site, which is cool. And anything you do buy gives me a bit of kickback as well. Helps me do what I do around here, which is awesome. Um, anyway, enough of that. I'm gonna finish my ride and you can check out this service bike that I'm currently riding. Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another J'adore Le Baguette. Uh, Chase Fellow production. Mon nom is gone toujours. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this bike here behind me, um, yeah, I built it a few episodes back and it's one of the cheapest builds I've ever done and I've been riding it for the last few weeks. Very quick summary for you. Virtually everything was sourced from AliExpress. It weighs just under eight kilograms as it sits uh, right here and it cost 1,023 quid to, uh, to put together. So, so yeah, incredibly cheap for a bike of this caliber. So around 600 miles on the clock at this point with this thing. So admittedly, not masses, but more than enough to give it a really good shakedown. Now, some of the things on this build have genuinely been fantastic, but other things have made me want to uh, swan dive into one of those big industrial uh, shredding machines. You know, the ones that like eat a scooter in, in one go. Uh, so uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's dive in, I guess. Right, very quick reminder, I've paid for everything in this build with my own cash, apart from the Senex crank set. I got that for, for, for free to review, but everything else I paid for with my own money. Um, but anyway, enough of that and let's go. Right, let's start with the good stuff. And these wheels from Elite Wheels have been have been fine. I've already kind of put a few thousand miles on them when I reviewed them in full last year. So you can go and check out that video if you want to know a bit more about them. But yeah, no problems at all on that front. And inside these wheels, I've actually been running these. So these are Ride Now Super Lightweight TPU inner tubes from AliExpress. And I can run these wheels tubeless, but I decided to give these a go. And yeah, they've been amazing. Now they are a bit more difficult to fit than regular inner tubes. And I saw a few people saying they, they lose air and they get pinch flats uh, a bit easier than regular butyl inner tubes. But I've not experienced that at all. These have been flawless basically. Now you do need a specialist patch kit, which I've got in here. So uh, where is it? There it is. So you can't use regular inner tube patches. You need to use a specialist ride now kit to fix any punctures. But I've not had any punctures actually over the last 600 miles. They're cheap, they ride well, and they're super lightweight. So yeah, can recommend. So this Senex crank set that I've been running on the build, really, really good. So the thing I like the most is that the teeth are a little bit thicker and more robust than some of the other fully aluminium crank sets that I've tried. So let me show you. So this is a chain ring from another set that I've uh, tried in the past. And you might be able to see, if you look at the inner chain ring there, those teeth are a lot thicker than they are 
on this one here. So, well, it's difficult to see, but but trust me, they are they are a lot thicker. Um, it is a little bit heavier as a result, but um, yeah, it's well worth it for the added durability. Now, it happens to be a SRAM dub standard, this one. So the axle running through the middle is 28.99 millimeters in diameter and the included bottom bracket is good quality as well it's got some nice weatherproofing and it doesn't creak or groan or anything like that so all in all this Senex cranks it here yeah nice and as we're down here these Costello pedals I've already done a, a full review on these already so I won't go into too much detail but to be frank I wasn't expecting them to last this long so I've been riding them for the last six months non-stop nor was I expecting to like them this much actually now <laughs> the main bearing is really starting to go on on both pedals actually so can you hear that loads of play in there so that bearing is not long for this world um, plus they're not the easiest things to clip into in the dark but they are a nice wide stable platform as a pedal and they are super lightweight as well so I'm gonna be sticking with them for the time being right then the group set so I'm running the L2 RX 12 speed mechanical group set and what can I say it's yeah it's been fantastic uh, I'll probably do a more in-depth review in the future but this thing is um, easy to install it shifts really nicely on the road it looks good and it's easy to clean and adjust now as with the R9 group set this one that I've reviewed before the RX group set also has an issue rattling over bumps so you can see this shifter paddle here has a tendency to clack against the brake lever and that can be a little frustrating but it's super easy to remedy just put a little bit of tape around that shifting paddle and that, that basically solves the problem so yeah color me freaking impressed with this group set i mean if you can get over the inability to shift properly in the drops then for the price the performance and overall build quality of this thing is pretty incredible actually and alongside this group set i've also been using an s road 12 speed cassette now i've had a few things to say about these s road cassettes in some other videos so you can go and check them out later if you like but essentially these cassettes are super durable because they're made out of chrome ollie steel but they're also really lightweight because the whole thing is milled out of a single block of that steel so yeah super durable and super lightweight now this one has been a great it, it was quite expensive actually so it was 91 quid to get this thing delivered to my house um so yeah not the cheapest thing in the world but it does shift really well and it is super lightweight um one thing to bear in mind with these 12 speed cassettes however is that they do fit onto 11 speed free hubs but the way the cassette is designed means the largest sprocket has a tendency to kind of overhang off the back of the free hub um fine for most wheel sets but wheels that have oversized hubs generally ones that use carbon spokes will often struggle to fit these cassettes on because they'll kind of interfere with the hub and they just won't spin properly um so yeah do bear that in mind but other than that this cassette has been yeah pretty fantastic actually right then to keep the cost down on this build i chose to run mechanical disc brakes did you just say mechanical di <laughs> mechanical disc brakes <laughs> so i'm using some hybrid hydraulic calipers from a brand called Z Race, their latest BR005 calipers <laughs> for those that are interested. And frankly, I have been, yeah, pretty impressed actually. Now I ran the previous generation of these of these calipers uh, for a few thousand miles actually on another build last year. And these improved versions are, yeah, are much better actually, not just in raw braking performance, but also in quality of life improvements too. Okay, so the first major difference is on this older version, the piston was on the other side of the caliper. So you can imagine when this was attached to the bike, the cable had to come out of the frame, take a sharp bend to feed into the other side of the caliper. With it on this side here, the cable run is a lot smoother and with mechanical disc brakes like this, the fewer sharp bends in the housing and cable, the better. Okay, the second major difference, and I'll zoom in here, on the old version, the, where the piston goes inside the caliper, there's no rubber seal there, so water can quite easily get in. On the newer one, they've put a rubber gasket there, so that's much better for weatherproofing. Thirdly, they simplified the design on this new one slightly, so it's just a two-piece design, whereas on this older version, you've got one-piece, two-piece, three-piece, so just you need an additional gasket and there's more chance for failure, really, so that's a little better. And I'll throw up some video, but essentially, the newer calipers came with more bolts to mount it to the frame, so more options, and that's always better. The older version only came with two bolts. And lastly, while I was servicing these, I came across something, so check this out. Okay, right, so I'm just giving these, uh, these brake calipers here 
a bit of a service. So I'm replacing the stock pads in them to see if I can get some better braking performance. But have a look at this. So the original pads are on the bottom here and these are the pads for the front and they're much bigger than the ones on the rear, which is really odd. I've never seen two different sizes of pads in a set, a set of calipers before. So um, yeah, I, I guess it makes sense because you're doing more braking on the front. So um, the pads on the rear don't need to be as big, I suppose, because you're not doing as kind of powerful braking on the, on the back. So a clever design decision, I suppose, but still really weird to see. But anyway, the, the original pads here, you can see they're a copper hue. So I think these are fully metallic pads, although it doesn't state it on the listing. And I'm replacing them with my preferred pads. So these are semi-metallics. So you can see there's copper speckled in with the kind of resin compound, the resin braking compound. So I'm hoping I get a little bit better braking performance out of these uh, these replacement pads because uh, uh, fully metallic pads are, are good, but they only really, you, you only get full braking performance when these reach a higher temperature. Um, whereas on the semi-metallics, you get better braking performance, better bite from cold. So I'll stick these in and see if we get some better braking. Now, I have yet to install these Juintec GT mechanical calipers here and and these things are honestly <laughs> a bit ridiculous really so these cost me 230 quid for both of these calipers so they are ridiculously expensive but they are four piston calipers which you can see there whereas these are two piston so uh, these could be twice as good who knows but to be honest I've actually put off installing them because I have been so impressed with these updated Z-Race calipers, especially with those semi-metallic pads. Yeah, the, the braking performance has been, <laughs> has been really good actually, but I will be putting these on later this week for a comparison, so stay tuned for that. Oh, and lastly, this SUMC chain that got supplied with the L2 group set, I was initially quite skeptical about it because I, I basically had a quick link from SUMC explode on me while I was pulling away from a set of traffic lights a few months back. And this thing seemed to be shedding metal shavings after the first few rides, which was a bit disconcerting. Um, but credit where credit is due, it has held up actually, and it doesn't fail uh, the chain wear gauge or anything like that. Um, I'm, still, I'm still not sure I'd recommend rushing out to buy one, but it, it, you know, it's held up so far. Um, anyway, those are the success stories for this build. So um, with those out of the way, let's uh, dive into the stuff that's <laughs> been a bit of shit, basically. Okay, so I'm just sat here editing right now, but while, while this shot is being set up, if I could ask you to subscribe and maybe hit the like button as well, that would be amazing. It's, li it's literally just me putting all this stuff around here together. So yeah, any help at all is super appreciated. Um, anyway, enough of that and let's crack on. Okay, so when I was choosing parts for the build, these bars really caught my eye because they follow a similar design to these set of bars actually that I'm running on my rim brake bike that are incredibly comfortable. Plus, they've got these. So either side of the kind of stem, they've got these cylindrical parts of the bar. So it's really easy to mount your Garmin and your GoPro mount. Um, whereas on most integrated carbon bars, you need an additional mount to sling underneath the bars here. So yeah, I was really intrigued to give these a go. So I slapped the bars on the bike and everything seemed okay. Cabling was easy enough and the install went fine. However, around 150 miles in, I, I noticed a massive crack forming around the steerer tube clamp. Now, obviously it was an AliExpress special, so yeah, no torque specifications were supplied with the bar. So I grabbed my torque wrench up here and I tightened that clamping bolt on there to four Newton meters, which I think is actually pretty conservative, but yeah, it was too much. Okay, so you can see here, there's a crack formed around the bolt there. And when I first saw it, I kind of hoped it was just a cosmetic crack in the paint or the lacquer or something, but you can see it permeates really deep into the meat of the carbon on both sides of that bolt. So I'm sure you can imagine if I was running this on my bike and I kind of really heavily front loaded the handlebars going over a bump, there's a risk this could have just sheared off at, at the steerer tube. So these things are a terrible design and they're complete trash. Now, I think there are probably two main reasons for this failure. The first is obviously the use of a single bolt here. I mean, you could probably get away with this design if the stem was made of aluminium, but on all the carbon steerer tube clamps that I've ever come across, they use two bolts in this area. So the use of one bolt here just concentrates too much of that clamping load into quite a small area of carbon. And number two, I suspect a lesser reason, but I think the resin probably didn't permeate 
properly into the, the carbon fiber in those areas, which would make them weaker and much more susceptible to the kind of delamination that I found on, on these bars. So yeah, not a great showing really, and those bars are definitely ones to avoid. Um, the replacements I got on AliExpress, again, just some random brand <laughs> I've never heard of called Aeronova, cost me about 60 quid, but I'm, I'm not really impressed with them either, to be honest with you. They went on okay and they're relatively easy to install and they're quite nice to ride, but, but check this out. There are some pretty obvious voids in the carbon. So again, could have some issues with the layup of the carbon fiber and uh, the resin penetration as well between those layers. Um, plus the, the way they drilled the holes for the steerer tube clamp. I mean, it looks like they were, they were done blindfolded. It's not clean at all and they don't really line up properly. But having said that, it has been fine over the last three, 400 miles, but just purely based on the presentation outwardly of this bar, I, yeah, I'm not sure I'd recommend it. Um, anyway, enough of that and let's check out the big ticket item here, this frame. So 323 quid I paid for this frame on AliExpress. So easily one of the cheapest disc brake carbon frames out there, I would say. Uh, and as it sits, in this kind of current form, it is actually a really nice frame. It feels nice to ride and it certainly feels fast on the flats. Now, because it is an, an aero road bike frame, you've got these nice chunky down tubes and chainstays here. It can be quite unforgiving on rougher roads because the frame is so stiff. But for that reason, it also feels explosive in the sprints. When you're putting the power down, the frame doesn't flex at all. So it certainly feels nice in that regard. But to get it to this point, i.e. <laughs> a frame that's nice to ride has been been a little bit of a journey actually so let me explain firstly those of you that watched the initial build video will know but cabling this bike in the first place was a massive pain in the ass uh, specifically running the brake line for the rear brake I mean I had to modify the frame slightly things kept catching it was super frustrating to say the least then once I'd finished the build and started to, to ride this bike issues with the seat post and the saddle clamp came up nearly immediately. Now, this is a problem area that I see time and again on these cheaper frames, so I wasn't really surprised at all. But in the words of Report of the Week, my day was ruined and my disappointment is immeasurable. So the saddle clamp is a terrible design, or at least the implementation here is dreadful. I mean, it was fine for the first few rides, but pretty soon the saddle started coming loose and, and rattling around. Um, as it happens, I kind of preempted this being a problem and already bought myself an updated carbon version of the saddle clamp, and I saved a tasty 32 grams over the, uh, <laughs> the stock aluminium one. So I decided to put that on to see if it would solve the problem. But as it happens, as I was doing that, I found something else entirely. Okay, so I'm just kind of messing around trying to get this uh, carbon saddle clamp attached to this bike here. And I've got to say, the way this particular screw sits in here is absolute trash. It's difficult for me to kind of show, but it just, yeah, it's crunching up the carbon when I, when I kind of do it up tightly. And I'm not sure if you can see, I'll throw some pictures up if it's not coming across, but there's just like, it's eating away into the carbon. There's like, like carbon shrapnel came out when I undid the bolts. So yeah, this whole seat post clamp is a bit trash to be honest with you, but I'll stick this on and um, yeah, we'll see if it holds, but yeah, not, not impressed with this at all. So I, uh, yeah, I tightened it all back up and got back on the road, but no bueno, I'm afraid. Have a look. So can you see that? It's just rocking back and forth. So it was nice and tight when I, when I left for the ride because I'd spent some time tightening those bolts up. But I think I showed you the bolt at the back had a tendency to eat into the carbon of the seat post. And I think over the course of the ride, it's, it's loosened up again. Now, unfortunately, there's no holes in the top of the saddle to be able to do those bolts up, which is a shame. But I mean, overall, I'm just not very impressed with the design of this saddle clamp. So I'll have to get back and see if I can kind of fix it, but we'll see. One hour later. Okay, literally just got in and it got a lot worse on the uh, latter half of the ride. So look at that. It looks like it's completely knackered, but I'm gonna pull it apart and see if I can fix it. So I pulled it apart again, cleaned everything, reapplied grit paste, got rid of one of the updated carbon parts because it started to crack and delaminate as I had tightened it all back up. And then I got back out on the road. 
Okay, so I'm just out on another ride after I thought I <laughs> fixed this saddle clamp, but now it's just so like creaky. So can you hear that? So that's just with my hand and a little bit of pressure. So you can imagine with my full body weight on this saddle, just every bump creaks so loudly. It just creaks like crazy. So yeah, not cool. So back to the garage, disassembled and cleaned everything again, ended up ditching the lightweight carbon saddle parts because they just, they weren't robust enough, uh, but I just could not get rid of the creak. I tried a new saddle, I tried grip paste again, I tried straight up grease, I even tried using like metal shims in the saddle clamp area to get rid of the creaking, but it just, it would not go away. So I actually ended up putting out a call for help on a YouTube short that I posted. And thank you to everyone that commented. It was really helpful. And I got some great advice specifically to look at the seat post itself within the frame. Now, I'd already covered everything in grip paste in an effort to, <laughs> to prevent this, but it clearly wasn't enough. So based on a comment I saw, I reverted to an old hack of mine and covered the seat post in some vinyl packaging. Let's see if I can find some here. Um, yeah, this stuff. So you can see it's just kind of plastic vinyl packaging. This is from a, a bed sheet there. And finally, it was fixed. So yeah, after a lot of faff with the seat post area and a new set of bars, the bike was creak free and I could finally start enjoying the rides on this thing. Well, not quite actually. I've, I've still got two extra bits to go here. Right then, two additional points with this frame. The first is that you might be able to see I've got some sealant around the seat post tube here. And it's basically this stuff. It's aquarium sealant, so silicon sealant. I just had this in the cupboard. And I've put some around the seat post there. Um, and it essentially stops any water sprayed up from the rear wheel from creeping its way down into the frame, which it definitely has a tendency to do. And then it rusts these bolts and stuff. So it's, it's a good idea to seal that up. Um, and I actually got that hack from a, another YouTuber called Oz Cycle. The, well, some of you may know he got embroiled in a bit of legal trouble uh, recently. And I, I'll, I'll stay clear of, of that topic, uh, but you can check that out if you want to. But credit where credit is due, guy knows his bikes and that is a good hack. And secondly, with this frame, I feel like I need to address these spaces here. So I'm running 50 millimeters of headset spaces, which is quite excessive. And the general consensus is that with a carbon steerer tube like this one, the absolute maximum is 40 millimeters. Basically, when you stack them this high, you run the risk of putting undue stress on the steerer tube and potentially snapping it. So the last place that it's supported is here with the um, bearing inside the headset there. So you can imagine when they're stacked high, if you put a lot of leverage on one side of the bars, it's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of stress on, on that steerer tube, basically. Now you can mitigate that risk to some extent by using an elongated expander plug, <laughs> which I, I'm actually not running. But the reason I'm running so many spaces is quite interesting actually. So yeah, forgive me while I explain. Okay, so both of these bike frames here are 58 centimeter aero road bike frames. One of the main differences being this one here was designed probably eight to 10 years before this one. So this head tube height here, this, this distance, is 205 millimeters here on this frame, whereas on this newer one, it's 168 millimeters. So this is much shorter. So on this frame, I'm running two centimeters of headset spaces, and this is a really comfortable riding position for me. So to emulate this handlebar stack height on this frame, I'm forced to run like five, five centimeters worth of spaces here. So it's a recent trend with race bikes where they really favor a more aggressive riding style. And yeah, to be a little bit cynical as well, it also enables manufacturers to claim lower weights for the same size frame, because you can imagine there's just less carbon material up the top here and it gives them better wind tunnel results because this is just a smaller frontal area. So this is gonna provide better aero basically than this frame here. Um, now I could probably drop the, the stack high here by a centimeter or two, but like I said, it's a really comfortable position for me. So I'm probably gonna stick with it. Um, anyway, with that, being, uh, with that being said, let's do what my mum told me to do in 2003 when I was arguing with my brother just before she served up uh, Christmas dinner. Do you want any of this? Because you better wrap this thing up right now, young man. And scene. Okay then, so here's the stuff from the build that was basically great straight out of the box. The Elite Wheels wheel set, the Ride Now inner tubes, the S-Road 12-speed cassette, the Senex crank set, the Z-Race 
brake calipers and the L2 12 speed group set. All fantastic, all really good value and basically zero issues. Um, <laughs> and the stuff that was, yeah, a little bit shit was, <laughs> was the frame and those set of handlebars. But after a bit of work on the, on the seat post area and a new set of bars, this bike is honestly really nice to ride. It's comfortable, it's quiet, it shifts really well. The braking is good and it looks really tasty as well, in my opinion. I mean, it absolutely eats up the miles around here in Oxfordshire. And I mean, for the price, <laughs> I'm honestly pretty proud of this build actually. But like I've shown, to get to this point <laughs> has taken a fair bit of effort on my part. Now, I always maintain that ultra budget builds like this can hold their own against bikes that are much, much more expensive. But often to get them there, performing at that higher tier does take that little bit of ingenuity and extra effort on your part. And yeah, this build is a perfect example of that. Now, another thing that, <laughs> that I always drone on about with builds like this is the importance of that first 500 miles and your diligence during that time as well. So in my experience, 99% of the issues that are likely to crop up will happen during that time. So ride these cheaper parts, put them under a bit of stress, but make sure you check your bike after every ride. I mean, it would have been quite easy for me to miss that crack on those set of bars. And I'm, I'm sure you could imagine that had the potential to be absolutely disastrous. Um, yeah, so with that in mind, should you replicate this approach? Well, if you want a really great value bike that you can just get out and ride, then no, do not take this approach. Pay a bit of a premium for a name brand bike or, you know, buy secondhand. However, if you want a project bike, something you can tinker around with, a bike that you'll probably end up explaining the nuances of to anyone that asks, which is <laughs> that's exactly what I tend to do if I ever meet one of you lot out in the in the real world, uh, then, then yeah, go for it. I mean, it can be so frustrating at times, but when it all comes together, it is such a rewarding process. And look, I've, I've said this before, but I am just some douchebag. <laughs> I don't have like a background as a bike mechanic or anything like that, which I'm sure, I'm sure is obvious to some of you out there. But what I'm trying to say is if I can put something like this together as, as kind of a, a hobby, then you are certainly capable. That's, that's, that's what I'll say. Um, now these brakes here, I know I keep saying I'll put them on, but I will genuinely have these on the bike um, this week. So get subscribed because I'll be putting a comparison of these with some, with some other calipers. Um, so yeah, subscribe if you uh, like this kind of stuff. Hit the like button. Uh, please, uh, if, if you enjoyed this, this episode. And if you've got any questions or comments for me about this build or, or anything like that, then make sure that comment is prefaced by at least eight baguette emojis or baguette. I'll just think I'll, I'll ignore it and you won't hear from me. So drop, drop me some baguettes <laughs> in the chat. Luke, stop trying to make baguette happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, right, anyway, that's, uh, that's enough of that. I'm, I'm going to head out on a bike right now, so I will see you next time. Ciao! Zing! Zing! Yes, <laughs> see you later. It's the bonus clip. Time to do do. Right then, so a quick bonus clip at the end here for those of you who are stuck around. And I know you lot always want to know what the final weights are for builds like this. So um, yeah, let's do the weigh-in. So I've got the Garmin GoPro mount on the front there. I've left the uh, the pedals, both pedals on, including these little pedal extenders here. And I've got the bottle cage on. So that'll keep Rides of Japan happy because in, <laughs> in one of his last videos, he mentioned that people that leave uh, pedals and bottle cages off, off kind of final weights um, were potentially being misleading. So <laughs> yeah, let's leave them on. Uh, and let's pop this on the scales here. So um, yeah, she is swinging and the final weigh-in is 7.94 kilos. So just under eight kilos for this thing, which I think is pretty good actually, um, considering kind of uh, the parts that I've put on here. So there we are, that's the final weigh-in and I'll see you all next time. I wanna see those baguettes.